Hey, man, I want to thank you guys for coming back to Lake Fork Marina once again. I want to thank my buddy David Ozio is here with me. And we're going to talk about some tournament fishing because it's kind of tournament season. The biggest cash payout, total cash payout tournament of the year is next, next weekend. weekend. Next weekend. Uh, the Sealy's Big Bass Splash. It's always a big deal, man. They always Sometimes they get over like 3,000 entries in that thing. It's insane the amount of people that show up to fish that deal. It's a really good payout structure. It pays deep into every hour. It's kind of... In my opinion, you, you can answer this. It, for me, it was always the easiest tournament to get checks in when I was tournament fishing out here. Yes. I mean, if you spend a lot of time going after unders, like yeah. I do, we yeah. chase unders a lot because I fish a lot of stringer well, tournaments I here. think anybody that tournament fishes this lake regular basis, you uh, got to uh, be able to catch you those you got to be able to catch unders. And so if you stay on the water enough and you go after those unders, you're going to catch those two pounders yeah. that are going to make money. Absolutely. And that's what it's all about. Yeah, you catch a two-pound fish in this tournament with the way they pay out so deep into the hour, you're for sure getting a check, no doubt. So, uh, But before we get started on tournament fishing and fishing in general, uh, today is, I hate to call it a special day, but we all know what today is. Uh, to, today is September 11th, and uh, I would be remiss if we didn't talk about that for a second because... I get to talk to all you guys here, and we're all pretty much on the same page on this deal, and I know that, but there's a whole lot of people that watch this, and you never know. We don't reach a whole lot of people. We got a small outreach on our channel, but, you know, when you start adding 1,000, 2,000 people, you never know who you're talking to. So um, it was a blessed day for me today. We had just a, a wonderful morning. It was one of the first mornings other than yesterday where it was, like, nice and cool. You had to wear kind of a hoodie or a pullover. Um, so I got to spend my September 11th fishing my favorite lake on earth, and I got to fish it with uh, Mr. Cody Mays, who's a great tournament fisherman out here in his own right. And uh, more important than that, though, Cody's, Cody's brother, Chauncey Mays, gave his life serving this country in Afghanistan with the United States Army. So it was great. And we didn't even plan it. We didn't talk about it. We didn't think about it. We just so happened to be in the boat. And we realized it together this morning. We were like, uh, oh, well, that's cool. So, you know, we have so many people that, that support this channel that watch what we do and, and, are, and are great supporters of what we do. From Nick Moore, who's a state trooper here in the local area. <clears throat> uh, like I said, Cody's family, Gold Star family. I've got countless veteran friends. We're kind of loosely affiliated with 22 Kill now, which is a great organization that helps both first responders and veterans that are dealing with some mental health issues, which obviously is a prevalent thing. Um, and we just have a lot of veterans Mr. Gary Payne's in the audience tonight. He's a former Marine himself, just like I am. And uh, it's really important that we don't ever forget this. And I know that, like I said, the people in this room won't, but it's important that we say that, uh, you know, we're going to remember that forever. You know, they can try to tear this country apart all they want to with all the media overblown nonsense that's going on these days. We all know what's happening in this country, and it's, it's absolutely insane that there's the amount of people falling for the nonsense that they are and buying into the nonsense to a point where they're, some of them, ruining their own lives by going out and committing the acts of violence that they are. Uh, and it's a crying shame that that's happening. But here's what I know. Here's what I know in my heart. What I believe. I shouldn't say what I know. Here's what I believe in my heart. As long as this country... It's still full of people like the people that showed up on September 11th, 2001, and all them first responders. As long as this country is still full of the hundreds of thousands, probably millions of young people at this point that have volunteered to serve in our military since and a lot because of September 11th, 2001. We've still got a country full of the finest people on earth. And we can talk about our economic prowess and we can talk about our policies and the politics and all the government stuff you want to. At the end of the day, this is the greatest nation that's ever existed for one reason, the people that reside inside it. And as long as we still got those type of people residing in this country, they can do whatever they want to to tear us apart because it does not matter. We got a bunch of people that will stand up and sacrifice their own well-being to take care of others. And when I think about 9-11, when I think about 9-11, I don't think about the people that died. Uh, I think about all the people that ran towards fire, not away from it, because this country's full of them, and it's an amazing place, and we're very fortunate to live here. So uh, I appreciate y'all letting me get that off my chest. It weighs on my heart every year when I realize what day it is. So thank you, guys. I will. Uh, y'all can send me the therapy bill next week, <laughs> and uh, we'll be all good. That being said, hey. Let's talk about what we're passionate about out here at Lake Fork, man. We're going we're gonna to catch some bass and make some cash. That's right. Coming up. So 
it's an interesting, interesting time of year. The way things, have, the weather and everything's very, very interesting for this time of year. Uh, water temps this morning were 80.7 degrees. Uh, they climbed a little bit throughout the day because we did get some sun and a little bit warmer weather. But uh, yesterday was the first day of the summer where the air temperature never got above the water temperature. So we talk about this in the pre-spawn period when the night temps never get below the water temperature. It means it means the water temps climb and then they maintain at night because the, the air temp never gets colder and then they climb the next and you really get that climbing water temp. Well, yesterday was the first day where we really had that cool trending, drastic cool trend where you had a night before that was cooler than the water temp, so the water starts cooling, a few degrees, and then the daytime never got above that temperature, so the water kept slightly cooling or maintaining, and then the next night was down in the 60s, so the water falls even more. So it was the first time where you had like a little bit of a shock, where it was like more than 24 hours of declining water temps, which is great, because what's been going on, and I, you know, we, we're talking about this, there is some stuff, on, some remnants of turnover on the main lake. There's not a thermocline left. There's not like a whole bunch of debris and bottom junk flow. It's not like a major hard deal. There is on the main lake, the deepest parts of the lake, there are pockets of remnants of turnover. But for the most part, the creek arms, the upper ends, I think the turnover is kind of done already. Well, yeah, because I mean, it's been cold, uh, unseasonably cold. Yes. Really. And a lot of cool water through rain. We've had right, a lot. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Don't bring that up also. Yeah. And so what that's done is it's dropped those surface temps. The top layer gets cold. It sinks. Mm -hmm. And with these several rains we've had, that water continues to sink, continues mm -hmm. to sink. There's an upwelling and you'll see the brown bubbles floating all over the place. Mm -hmm. And I was telling these guys a while ago that it's showing up on the side of my boat. Yeah, and I mean that's a sign been, for us guys that are out here all the time cleaning that yeah. brown muck yeah. off the side of my boat, and yeah. it's and it's like what he's talking about in the creeks where I've been spending a lot of time now in the past week in the backs of the creeks. Mm -hmm. If you're on the back side of a cold front like we have the last couple of days, I was in a creek today that was 77.2. There you go. This morning. And yeah, so, I took that that temp on the main lake, so yeah, that's yeah. very. So yeah, you yeah. think that in the back of that creek a week ago, maybe ten days ago, was ninety one. The water in, in backs of the creeks are going to be the hottest, more so than the main lake. And so yeah, now you've had an, an enormous drop in water temp in a lot of those places, and sometimes it'll actually wreak havoc on the way those bass bite. Yeah, it can wreak havoc. And so from what I've seen over the last couple of weeks. It seems like is is the lake turn. So when the lake does turn over, uh, what it does is it creates a low oxygen content because the the water at the bottom of the lake that is now rising, that water at the bottom has little to no oxygen in it over the summer months as it gets hotter and hotter. That dissolved oxygen rises in the bottom of the lake doesn't have much. So when the lake starts to turn, all that low oxygen water comes up, and those fish a lot of the time, most of the time, every time I've been around a turnover situation, especially the harder the turnover, the more exaggerated this happens everything bait fish bass life every they go to the bank and they kind of spread out on the bank and it makes it a challenge because like when do you just go to a big giant twenty-seven thousand acre lake and just go cruising down the main bank on the main lake like you never think to do that and there's so much of it to cover and now you've got fish kind of scattered throughout it some in the creeks miles of creek some on the main lake they're just all over the bank and it's a really random, it brings a lot of randomness to where you can locate fish. Uh, and then as the turnover starts to reside and the water starts to really cool off for the fall period, that's what everybody talks about, the shad pushing in the creeks. Well, those shad go boom and spread out on the bank. And then some of them will go into the creeks and the bass will follow. And some of the bait source and some of the bass will pull back out and start to group up on main lake structure. Now, what I've seen is we still don't have groups of fish. They bit a lot better today and yesterday. They bit a lot better the last couple days, especially today. But I still was only catching one fish like in a spot. Like we never had a, a time today where we caught a fish and then we threw back in there and caught another one. So that tells me that these fish aren't really grouped yet. We're not in fall feeding frenzy period or anything like that. Like nothing crazy is happening but that cooler weather did fire them up and get them to bite a little more consistently and the challenge of this time of year fishing turnover and immediate post turnover that that summer to fall transition you guys have heard me refer to the last couple weeks the challenge of, of this time of year is the randomness to where they can be located uh, so the first thing i want to go into tonight that i want to show you guys i'm going to kind of show you on the whiteboard here is where i've been seeing the big groups of bait fish because right now 
that's the only thing for me that has mattered. If I can find the overwhelming amount of bait fish, then I can catch some quality fish. Uh, but if I kind of find the bait fish, you know, there's a little bit here, a little bit there, I don't catch anything. And when I say an overwhelming amount, the only way that I know to tell you guys is when you see it, you won't have any doubts. Like, if you pull into an area, you're like, well, I wonder if this is what Billy meant by a lot of bait fish. It's not. It's not. We're talking about bait fish and flicking so much. If it's calm, the bait fish will be popping the surface. You'll think it's raining. There'll be so many of them. Uh, when you can see, if you got your good glasses on, like these waterland glasses right here, sun shining, you, it'll look like diamonds glistening under the surface of water everywhere you look. That's the kind of overwhelming amount of bait fish I'm talking about. Now, they move a little bit every day. So what I'm about to go over with you guys, you've got to take this as a general rule, not an exact rule by all means. Because every day I'm having to go to these areas that I'm finding bait in and slide up and down the bank. Birds are a big component right now. A lot of these bait fish we're keying in on are the little bitty thumbnail shad, flicker minnows, whatever you want to call them. They're the smaller shad, right? And so even the white birds, we normally kind of ignore the white egret we pay more attention to the blue heron because he eats the bigger bait fish like bass do. Well, right now, blue herons and white egrets, you'll actually see them together all over the place right now because they're both eating what's available. And what's available is overwhelming quantities of these small shad. And so I'm looking for any type of a, a, you know, a stabbing bird, a crane, white, gray, blue, whatever, just any type of a, a, a fish eating bird. If they're lined up on the bank, three, four, five of them, that's gonna tell me the other day, and I know I'm kind of talking in circles. The other day, uh, a couple days ago, I pulled into an area where I've been catching some good quality fish. And I pull into this stretch where the bait fish have been located where I've been getting bit. And we're fishing and we're not getting it. We get one short strike and we, we don't hook up. But we're not getting bit. And I look up and I see a heron and three white birds. And, and they're like 500 yards down the bank. And I'm like, hmm. In my head, I'm going, well, I just wonder if they just shifted. There's no reason for these bait fish to travel over there. There's no creek channel swing over there. It's just the most, there's no grass over there. There's not even any timber over there. Like, there is no reason for these fish to be over here. So normally this is a stretch of bank that I never touch. But the birds were there. And like I said, there's a lot of randomness to what's going on. Well, so we just kind of fished our way to it. Lo and behold, we got over there, we catch a couple. So it's, it's a lot of randomness. You really got to have your fishing shoes, your fishing mind turned on and pay attention to all the little stuff to kind of clue you into where these bait fish might be located. So let's talk for, for a little bit, just a second, about kind of where I'm seeing these fish located at and then we'll get more into techniques that are working right now. So what I've got kind of here is I've got a couple things drawn. So this is going to be a creek arm. I know it doesn't look great. I know I'm not an art major. I get it. But this is like a major creek arm. This is a a Dale, this is a Rogers, this is a Burks, this is any major creek arm on here, okay? And, and what, just kind of the general area of where I'm finding these fish. You know, last week I was kind of finding them out here, out, out here at the mouths of the creeks on the first points, the second points, right out towards the mouth of the creek. But here this week, and especially the last couple days, I'm actually going, you know, a third to maybe two thirds back in the creek, kind of the middle part of the creek arm seems to be the section of these major creeks where the most amount of bait fish is located right now. And within this big area, I'm just looking for points. It seems like to the best that I can recall here lately, every school, massive school of bait fish that has been productive for me, it may not be on a point, but it's kind of relating to a point. So there'll be a point, right? Let's say there's a point right here. There's a little point sticking out right here. So they may not be right here. Sometimes they are, but they're gonna be within say, you know, a couple hundred, 300 yards of either side. So what I'm doing to kind of take away the dead water for me is I'm focusing on the section of creek that I've been finding them in and I've just kind of followed them in over the last couple weeks. And within this section, I'm finding every point, and then I'm going to that point and just beating feet up and down the bank with my trolling motor looking for bait. And then when I find bait, I'll slow down. Okay, so that's kind of how I'm locating them in the creek arms. Now, one thing that I will tell you is this morning, we caught some in like the back back of a pocket. But that pocket, guess where that pocket was? About halfway back in the creek. So, now let's let's say we got this right 
So we're halfway back in the creek. We're in our go zone where the massive amount of bait has been. And then we've got a pocket. Well, I've been catching these fish out here. But today with the recent cool down, we actually started out here and just kind of went like this. And we caught most of our fish back here. So, like I say, guys, I wish I had a more exact thing to tell you. Go to secondary points, go to channel swings. That's just not what's happening. And it doesn't have to be in a certain depth. I mean, these fish and these bait fish are running around in this much water a lot right now. Like most of the time, they're in this much water. So you really have to be open-minded. You really got to get your trolling motor on. And that's why it's important to fish uh, certain techniques that are going to be efficient that you can fish and cover water with, and then have other techniques that when you locate fish can really kind of milk an area and draw some extra bites for you. And that's really my two prong approach right now is to have search baits that I can fish effectively and efficiently, and then have other baits that I can slow down and finesse fish with and get every bite possible, okay? And that's exactly what I did today. Let's go, As you tell us it. about it. As you call it. <laughs> tell I, us about it. I had it. a phenomenal day today. Um, today I mean, was good. They bit today. Today yeah. was insane. Yeah, today was I, for my unders, I mean, I had over 10 pounds for my best five today. And it was an identical same thing. Search bait and found the ones that would be willing to bite. And then whenever the bite stopped, I pulled out a wacky worm and there was vegetation edges. And I would just take time, throw that wacky worm or Cinco up onto the vegetation edge. You throw it up and then pull it off and then just let it fall and let it sit there. And for at least three, four, ten seconds, whatever the case, bump it once, reel it in, do it again. And I'd throw it up there on that vegetation and just move it once. Next thing you know, there it goes, swimming away. And so that's how I ended up catching a lot of numbers today, just for that. The search bait showed me the vicinity we're in. Well, it didn't hurt that I was sitting in a spot throwing up on the vegetation and I happened to look down and a cloud of shad just went right by. I could see them. They were all about that long. And they were just mm -hmm. right on the surface. They weren't bothered with me at all. They just, eh, going about your business. And <laughs> they moved from here to that wall right over there. And all of a sudden, <laughs> saw a yeah. roll on them. I kind of put that rod down, picked that other one up, and threw it over there like that. Made about three cranks. Bang! And he hit it. Yeah. You know, and one of them was a 202 on my scale, on the Rapala scale. Mm -hmm. You know, so anytime you see a fish roll like that, especially when you're in the pockets he's talking mm -hmm. about, or in the creek, or on a channel swing, shallow channel, whatever the case, yeah. and something rolls the water, even if I had a drop shot, man, this has happened now in the past two weeks, probably five times, and I'm sitting on a point or sitting on something, and all of a sudden the water roll, I take the reel up that drop shot real quick and throw it over there, and unbelievable, boom, an under would hit it. You know, yeah. so just get something over there at it and then take your chances. 100%. And so let's talk about that a little bit because, and I know you've seen this too, everybody that fishes a lot sees this. And a lot of you guys that spend a lot of time in the water are already going to know this, so bear with me on this. But, man, I can't tell you how many times I'll have a customer in the boat and there'll be just a splash on the surface and the guy's like, well, they're schooling or one blew up or whatever. And a lot of the time that's not one actually blowing up. That's just a shad, happy to be a shad. We've got a ton of gizzard shad in this lake. If y'all ever heard that real loud slap sound on the surface, that's a gizzard shad just being a gizzard shad, dude. Like he's not running. When shad are actually being chased, what Dave was talking about rolling and I call it you know, flushing or swirling, yeah. you'll actually hear a little bit of a suction before the blow up when a bass blows up on something on the surface. There's a different sound if you pay close enough attention. And also the, the, the rolling and the, and the swirling and the flushing, uh, and a lot of times if you actually get lucky enough to see it, you'll see shad disperse. Sometimes they'll come all the way out of the surface and disperse with these little shad. Sometimes you'll just see them run all across, like waking across the surface. When you see that, for sure there's, they're getting eaten, like something is eating them. And if you can get a bait to there fast enough, you'll usually catch one. Uh, or maybe more than one if, you know, especially as things start to cool off more, you'll catch more than one. But, um, but that's what you want to look for. That little flicker, that little pop, that little slap, that's just a bait fish being a bait fish. But if you see bait fish skipping along the surface or flushing, swirling out of there, that's what you're actually looking for. So I just, I don't know why, but it seems like I've seen a lot of people over the years that just don't understand the difference. Just anything that happens on the surface, they want to throw at. And a lot of times there's, there's no reason to. Learning what it is is key because a lot of times you'll see something like a, a carp or a, a gar, gar golden surface yeah. and somebody, a yeah. uh, client's with me says, look, there's one over there. Yeah. 
said, no, that was a gar. And so understanding what it is that makes those rolls over, you do this long enough and you can figure out exactly <laughs> when it's a bass, you'll know it's like he said, yeah. it's a, he doesn't really breach or nothing. He just, and you just could, almost like a, a little like that, a whirlpool in a, in a way, whenever he comes up and hits something. The funniest thing is, you know, you spend enough time on the water over the years and it's like, you don't even have to see it anymore. You could actually hear, hear right. the different sounds that they make when they surface. And that bass just has a very distinct, and it's very subtle, it's very hard to pick up on until you've heard it a million times, but there's a very distinct suction right before the splash that you hear, or the swirl that you hear, the flushing that you hear. There's just a little suction right before it, and it gives away that that's a, a bass most likely for sure it's a predatory fish eating something mm -hmm. for sure so um let's talk a little bit about uh the baits or let's talk a lot about it and if y'all have any questions at any time please just shout it out raise your hand actually what's funny nick we gave you a shout out earlier and you weren't even here now our state troopers in the house man I can't I you, you heard us talking about you his ears were burning his old ears was burning boy that's right now you're gonna have to watch tomorrow night. <laughs> yeah, see how bad I was talking about you. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, I'll church it up for you, buddy. Uh, no, but so on techniques, you know, it's been a little bit of a changing ball game. You know, a lot of changes in the water comb. So the baits have, have been a changing ball game for me over the last couple of weeks. And you know, I was throwing these really small three and a half inch swim baits on a little underspin, three out underspin, and still have that tide on, still throwing that. But in the low light conditions this week, um, the chatterbaits kind of come back into play for me a lot. And today, that was what we caught the majority of our fish on was a chatterbait. Now, that was our primary search bait here recently. Also, the little swim bait. Also, small lipless crankbaits have been phenomenal. Anything that looks at the shad pattern, uh, small quarter ounce lipless crankbait, man, that's going to catch you a lot of fish. I will tell you this, it's going to catch a lot of small fish. And spending the day with Cody Mays today, Cody's had just, he only started fishing this lake at the beginning of last year, beginning of 2019. And watching what he's done in these tournaments has been unbelievable. The amount of money this guy has won tournament fishing out here, he, he won almost $50,000 last year in cash and prizes. So this guy has had just, I mean, you're talking about fishing weekend, amateur, big bass hourly tournaments and making that kind of money. Like he's got something figured out. And one of the, Probably the biggest thing I took away from him today that was really, I guess I've always known this, but I never really put it into these terms. It was really eye-opening was he, he always tries to focus on throwing baits and techniques that have a high probability of catching good numbers of small fish, but also those same techniques are known to catch giants like a drop shot. A drop shot is a bait that's notorious for catching numbers of small fish. But especially on this lake, and really all over the place for that matter, a drop shot's also notorious for once in a while, the biggest fish in the lake will eat it. Like that's a, a bait that's known for that. A chatter bait is another one that's known for catching numbers of two pounders, but at the same time, giants will eat a chatter bait. Um, and one thing that Cody says is he really tries to narrow his baits down and focus on techniques that have the high probability of doing both at any given time. And I thought, you know, that's really simple. It's as simple as it gets. But man, that's genius, you know? Mm -hmm. Like that's genius because if I'm throwing like a big movement 80X or if I'm pitching a big half ounce, three quarter ounce jig, I'm not fishing for both. You're limited. I'm fishing for four and five pound plus fish. So, I'm, you know, and rarely, listen, the bottom line is you're not gonna catch an over every day. 24 inch fish is a big, you guys know I've caught, I've had more 10 pounders come in my boat that were in the slot than were over. A 24 inch fish is a super long fish. It's hard to catch them. So your odds of catching that 24 inch fish, you can't make a consistent check out here in tournaments fishing only for the overs. You have to be able to catch the unders. So using techniques that are known to catch unders but still have that capability, to me that was just like genius. Like mm -hmm. I really thought that was really good insight of, of him. Time of the year too dictates when you can do that. And I'll give you the point with the drop shot. I mean, during the spring, certain patterns, uh, we were fishing a five fish stringer tournament, media bass. Oh, this was a few years ago. And we had two 10 pounders in one day and both of them were slot fish. A 10-2 and a 10-4. <laughs> that's, that's, that's unfortunate. I mean, it's you know, very most, unfortunate. Most people go a lifetime and don't catch a 10 pounder. We caught two that day mm -hmm. and had to just pitch them right back, you know? And so, um, it, but 
um, the spring is an excellent shot chance for that pattern to work where you can use a drop shot not only to catch small ones but big ones and another pattern uh, that we use that we've had the same thing happen certain times of year is a shaky head and a shaky head will catch a giant and it'll also catch one that's about six inches long and so you almost always have to have one of those tied on on the deck and it just depends on the architecture of what you're fishing whether that will work yeah. or not based off what the bottom construct is uh you know what you're throwing it at is what there covers around wood down yeah, there yeah. whatever the case you know so it's something that you always have to have tied on on the deck yeah absolutely to me one of the you know i've you have so many of these conversations you know as a fishing guide and especially for me doing what we do with all the informative content on youtube so many people want to ask you all these you know ask you questions and i love it that's great that's what i want um but a lot of fishing gets over complicated. We overthink it a lot. Like people want to figure it out to a point where they know they're going to catch fish if they do X, Y, and Z. Well, that's just not the way this game works. Like these fish have a really small brain and they do really dumb things for really dumb reasons. Like we got big brains and we do dumb things for dumb reasons sometimes. They do it like every day, all day. <laughs> you know, like some of the stuff they're going to do is not, there's no exact science to it whatsoever. And a lot of it to me boils down to understanding seasonal patterns and what different light conditions do like all that stuff matters but at the end of the day you just got to put the odds in your favor fish high percentage areas for the conditions and time of year you're fishing and then and this is maybe the most important part fishing baits that you can fish efficiently in the area you're fishing so if you're fishing a grass area don't throw a square bill you know what i mean like if you things like that it seems really simple but if you're fishing a, a point that has super thick timber, hey, instead of throwing that shaky head, throw a Texas rig. So it'll slide through there a little better. You know, like being able to fish efficiently is so important. And that's the reason that I have different moving baits that I want to throw, a lipless crankbait. Well, if I get a really thickly timbered shallow flat, I don't want to throw that lipless crankbait. But if I'm around a relatively open flat or one that has some scattered grass in it, that lipless crankbait is very effective very effective chatterbait grass it's effective timber it's not that weedless swim bait the reason it's still there and the reason it's going to stay there is because when i get around a bunch of timber i got to throw that weedless swim bait or a square bill so you got to have all these things ready to go to especially now when we're covering so many different areas and so many different types of areas and just covering a bunch of shallow water you got to have all this stuff ready to go so that where whatever area you're in you can present the bait efficiently that's would you get it's so important to me Today was a prime example of what I see, the number one mistake I see, especially a lot of tournament anglers, are the weekend guys that come out here, and it happened to me today. I'm in an area where I had found these fish on a search bait, all right? And I got quite a few bites in about a one, maybe an hour, hour and 20 minute period. And boy, I was just having a good old time, you know? And then <clears throat> I'm covering them, just still throwing, still throwing, and then I realize an hour's gone by and I ain't had a bite, you know? and that right there tells you that well you know something's happened here you know so this is when you pick up a texas rig a wacky worm something that's slightly different that's maybe even in the finesse category slow down where, yeah. where i live yeah. all right and so and that's exactly what you do that's where the wacky worm comes in handy or something like that because if i'm in an area where there's fish and all of a sudden now they're not eating this chase bait anymore uh, there's got to be a reason, so let's change up the whole dynamic and see what we can come up with. Mm -hmm. And bingo, that was the uh, mm -hmm. that was a big part of the answer, you know. So you can't get married to sometimes that that chase bait or the bait you caught them on at eight yeah. o'clock in the morning. Yeah, I've caught eight on a chatter bait, and then and at two o'clock yeah. you're still throwing the same yeah. bait. Yeah. You sometimes you better you better take a big uh, uh, inventory of that and say, hmm, you know what? Maybe that wasn't a good idea. So, hey, you know what fishing is like? It's like marriage. You better be quick to admit you're wrong, buddy. <laughs> <laughs> so, but diversify out and, you know, use some other techniques and see because if you change that up and you're in an area where those fish are, you can catch them and continue that bite going. And you know what you could probably do too is refire them up. If you're in an area where, yeah. where you know, they're on a grass line or they're on a, a high sun line or something like that and all of a sudden you get a couple of bites, this has happened especially in the last two weeks where i've had clients in the boat and then all of a sudden one guy sets a hook and catches one and then all of a sudden the other guy which his bait wasn't that far away we doubled up and we had that happen several times and so that's there's something to that 
don't know exactly what it is, but it does have a tendency to maybe fire the fish up so you can present something else and then uh, continue catching. Yeah, fish are for sure 100% um, jealous. <laughs> it's like your kids, like you got two kids, like I got two boys, right? 10 and seven. And we could be going along not thinking about ice cream at all. But if one of them gets an ice cream cone, the other one's going to have to have an ice cream cone. That's right. And these bass are a lot the same way. They could be over there, and you could have done put a hurt on them a little bit, put a hurt on them, and then caught several, and then they kind of quit biting and disperse a little bit. And then you throw a wacky worm in there, something a little more finesse, hazing their face a longer. You get one to bite, and all of a sudden this fish sees this fish acting like a feeding fish, and he's like, where's the food? Because they're very opportunistic. Like, their instincts are honed in to being opportunistic. The way they survive is by taking advantage of every feeding opportunity possible because they don't know when the next one's coming. They can change when there's a change. So they are built to take advantage of every feeding opportunity. And when they see another fish acting like a feeding fish, it makes them go more on the hunt, more aggressive. How many times have we, we pulled a bait up and seen other fish chasing and trying to take it out of there? Nah.